Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Jamie Sunsbach. I'm one of the co-organizers here for One Million Cups Rochester. And on behalf of all of my fellow organizers, some of who are, are in this chat, thank you for joining us today. Uh, once again, in the virtual world, we hope that very soon uh, we'll be able to meet in person again. Um, it's just, uh, you know, how things are going. And, and I think this is a good way to keep momentum going. But definitely, we, we will, uh, as soon as we're able, be back in person. And at the same time, I think we're really thinking hard about how to also uh, be online as well uh, to cater to people who might not be able to make it for various reasons. So we are working on that, but we need to uh, need to find uh, just just find that perfect time to get back together again in person. So a couple of housekeeping things today. So out of courtesy to our speakers, if you're not a speaker, please mute yourself. Um, There'll be an opportunity during the Q&A to ask questions of our presenters. So please use the chat button, which is located down at the bottom. And just, uh, you can either throw a question in or you can just say, I'd like to ask a question. And then when I call your name, just feel free to unmute and ask your question. And then as always, we have this wonderful poll, which I will launch right now. These, uh, if you could just take a second and answer both of these questions. Um, this helps us in our reporting to back to Kansas City to the Kauffman Foundation, which is the home of One Million Cups. And we'd like to uh, give them the data that they're looking for as well. Um, so for any first timers, uh, just a description of what One Million Cups is. It's a free program designed to educate and inspire entrepreneurs around the country. And most importantly for us here, right here in Rochester. Each month will feature great entrepreneurs with amazing stories from around our region. And, and really for One Million Cups, the very powerful question that we ask our entrepreneurs is how can we as an entrepreneurial ecosystem of Rochester help you, the presenter, succeed in your business venture? So for all of our attendees today, it's really your job to listen to what our presenters are asking and really finding ways to help. Um, and speaking of help, we couldn't, we couldn't put on One Million Cups if it wasn't for our fantastic sponsors. I'm gonna shut down the poll here really fast. Thank you all. Uh, so first and foremost, the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. This is the group that launched One Million Cup, it, Cups in over 160 markets across the nation, uh, most of which are happening right now. Uh, so it's an amazing opportunity that no matter where, what city you go to, chances are on a Wednesday at about 9 a.m., you're going to find uh, One Million Cups active and going. Um, our other local sponsors, so Collider, the Music Camp Group, Ready, Destination Medical Center, B Shed, Duncan, Cedar, Trail Creek Coffee Roasters, and Cafe Steam. Um, all fantastic sponsors. Um, and just to uh, uh, train our group here, um, I think we should all give our sponsors a round of applause. So please, silent clapping or loud clapping if you want to unmute for our sponsors. Thank you so much for believing in One Million Cups. Announcements. Does anyone have announcements for things that might be upcoming here in the next month? Feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Christine? I'll just share that on the 14th of July, we are doing our next WE Forum, and this is going to be on branding and intellectual property and how to structure your business as you get started. And uh, we also have an E1 Tech Talk coming up, right? That's correct. We coming actually today. have two in July. Um, we have one that's going to happen on the 23rd of July with David Russick, and we have one that is going to happen on... Oh, darn it, now I'm not going to have the date. Do you have it anywhere, Jamie? Is it the 30th? Um, hmm. I'm going to so find it the last... in the chat room. How's that? <laughs> okay. That would be the last Thursday. Oh, well, we'll figure it out. Any okay other announcements? Sorry? It's okay to put those all in the chat? Yep, absolutely. Yep. Any other announcements? Nothing? 
Well, I can say that our uh, Collider's educational class, The Basics of Entrepreneurship, uh, From Idea to Customer, it will launch next week. Um, registration is now closed. Um, so we have uh, 25 wonderful people who have uh, expressed interest in joining us and helping, uh, allowing us to help uh, them on their journey to build a business. So I think that's really cool and exciting. So that course will run for eight weeks and hopefully we'll be able to report back at the end of eight weeks, some really positive results and hopefully created more people to flow into 1 million cups. So that would be a fantastic thing. Um, all right. So without further ado, I will introduce our first presenters. Um, so let's give a virtual round of applause for Juan Pablo and Tanya from Hacer. Thank you very much for the applause. <laughs> thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, well, thank you, Jamie, Amanda, for having us here and sharing One Million Cup to us. We are part of the Hispanic Advocacy and Community Empowerment Through Research nonprofit. We are located in the Twin Cities, spe um, specifically in St. Paul. And we developed this program that it's called Creando Ando. And before giving you a whole picture of what Creando Ando is and how did we get involved in this project, I'm gonna guide you through what is ASER, how did we come to light and what are we doing for the community? We do have to specify that we are a nonprofit. And today we're here to present you guys what one of our biggest and pilot programs uh, for entrepreneurship. We are oriented this pro we are orienting this program specifically to Southern Minnesota and we are starting in Rochester. SARE was created in 1988 as a cohort of different organizations that realized that Latinos weren't giving enough attention and the policies that were developed for them weren't actually addressing the real needs. That's why SARE um, was created by the universities, Metro State University, Clues, and um, the Ramsey County in order for them to start addressing these problems to start creating more research that actually could help to come to light, to bring to light what Latinos needs are in Minnesota. And on the, with this um, whole travesty, the uh, ACER has been growing. It has had up and downs as any other nonprofit. And up to date, we have already seven people working. We have six people uh, full-time and one part-time staff member. We are, we are located in first for the very first time in our own office. And we are doing more programs than we ever thought. We first started as a research-oriented uh, nonprofit. And now because of our research and the impact of our research, we are developing more workshops that empower those areas identified through our research. And most of them are oriented to um, leadership, entrepreneurship, and also other healthcare um, um, workshops. So in this regard, and as I said, we are here to give voice to those Latinos that sometimes or most of the times are in the shadows. And we, our programs are always free and are always dedicated to empower the community because we believe that building a strong pillars, a strong roots within our community, our community will have better opportunities created and owned by themselves. Uh, I'm Tanya Eden Pinedo, and my coworker here is Juan Pablo Higuera. I'm, I'm originally from Mexico. I've been in Minnesota for a year now, and I am a research associate at ASER. I'm dedicated to promote and create leadership programs as well as entrepreneurship programs with Juan Pablo. I've been working in the private sector and public sector in my country for a long time now. And in here, I not only work at ASER, but also work at, at Ergotron to develop market in Latin America. Juan Pablo, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Tania. So my name is Juan Pablo. Uh, some of you know me. I work as a research associate at ASER as well, and I'm originally from Colombia. Thank you. And let's get to the point. What is Creando Ando, right? Uh, why do we do this and why are we here? Well, it's very simple. 
Creando Ando was Creando Ando was created in order to build entrepreneurship mindsets and also create better self-esteem on entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs that in, within Latino community that haven't been able to take that step. We want them to feel confident enough to create their own business, to actually develop their business ideas, but also be aware of what are some of the constraints and um, some of the some of the bumps they're going to find on their way and how can they come up, pull up with those and how can they be better in order for them to be successful. We have identified that Latinos are one of the big, one of the communities that are more entrepreneurs with among all of the different communities in Minnesota, but also are the ones with the highest rates of highest rates of finishing earlier on time. So they close their business really fast. And that's because they don't have a business background. As you, as Marty was saying, um, they don't really know how to do business and they are just struggling with the lack of information and we want to be there for them. Therefore, this program was created in order for them to give them the tools to be successful and to also empower the community that it's in Rochester, the Latino community that it's in Rochester. Um, yes. This is a uh, program, I'm sorry, Juan Pablo, but no I just want to say that this is a program with that we developed with the help of ACLA, Rochester Area Foundation. We were uh, sponsored by Southern Minnesota Initiative Foundation. We also work with the Destination Medical Center, Collider, of course, and uh, the city of Rochester. So, uh, thank you, Tanya. So, why Creando Ando? So, Creando means, uh, it's in a Spanish name, actually. And creando means to create, and ando means to advance. So in Spanish, sounds very catchy, creando ando. But why we decided to do it in Rochester? Yes, Tania, uh, it's right that we're we're trying to 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 replicate this project in other parts of southern Minnesota. But we decided to start to start in Rochester due to four reasons. The first one, the Destination Medical Center. As you all know, this project will change the landscape, the way Rochester. Its view, uh, not not only in Minnesota but nationwide and even worldwide. That's the idea of the Destination Medical Center to create uh, a place where health and wellness it's 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 essential. Second, population growth. So uh, and 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 we'll go to the next slide, uh, Tanya, in a bit. Third, Latin America population growth, and fourth which wasn't included when we presented the idea, but now we have to deal with it, COVID-19. So let's go to the next slide, uh, Tanya. So the population right now in, 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 in Rochester, it's around 120,000 inhabitants. Most, I mean, the majority are women, but only 4% of them are uh, from Latin America. Now, in 15 years, and according to uh, the demographic uh, department of Minnesota, the population of, of Rochester will grow around 25%, meaning that it's going to be one of the cities, if not the, the city that is going to present the greatest growth uh, in Minnesota. This is mainly because of DMC, the Mayo Clinic expansion. So that will bring new jobs, new population, but most important, the Latino, in that growth, in that 25% growth, the community that will grow the most, it's the Latin American community. It's going to be, it's going to, to uh, it's going to be almost 6% of the total population. So I think that's a, that, that, that was a, a very interesting point to do Creando Ando in, in, in Rochester. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Tania. So we're, we're, we're doing a very innovative approach. Creando Ando, it's not, what we wanted, it's not only like, uh, okay, let's talk about entrepreneurship in the Latino community, which is, which is very high, as Tania mentioned, but they, they, don't success, they don't succeed very often. So what we're trying to do is to have a very innovative mindset. Uh, so we're utilizing design thinking which is a, a way to, to solve problems, to solve individual problems from a community pers perspective. Uh, so we're utilizing design thinking. We are uh, focusing on entrepreneurship. We're working on training and we're offering a business guideline knowledge. With that, we're offering three sessions. The first one already happened. Um, 
the first session already happened, which was a work cafe last Friday. Uh, with, we had nine participants. We were expecting to have 16, but we, we need to be honest, uh, things change. Uh, and I think for everyone change as well. So the way we do outreach, we, the way we market our program had to change suddenly. And I think that happened to all of you. So we had nine participants. We, we did uh, design thinking on what problems they, 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 they faced in Rochester when they wanted to open a business. And we tried to come up with some solutions. We also, uh, uh, and, and Tanya can give more information on that, uh, on design thinking on, we gave them the opportunity to create a product. On session, on the next session, which is on July 24th, which uh, the same people that attended to the first to the first session will attend to the second one. We're going to focus on self confidence and elevator pitch. Uh, we believe, and as a research organization, we've seen that that self confidence Latinos will lack a lot of self confidence. Sometimes because of our background, sometimes of because of what we have gone through to get to America. But self confidence is very very low in in Latinos sometimes, and that that that's a challenge or a barrier when you're starting a business. So we're going to work on self-confidence and we're going to uh, work an expert at uh, the elevator pitch. And the third session, we're going to, to work with the city of Rochester to clarify some, 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 uh, to clarify some concerns partic participants had on how to create a business in Rochester, the importance of being a minority business enterprise, uh, and how to register a business in the city. And finally, what we want to do is we want to do something similar like one, one, um, one million cup, but for these participants and in Spanish. This program is completely in Spanish. And finally, uh, what are the expected outcomes? Uh, we want to create two new, new business owners. All of these are people who, wants to be an, who want to be entrepreneurs. So we want to create two new business, uh, to certify two new business. And we want one person to start the certification to become a minority business enterprise. So I know you see these numbers and you say only two on one, but it's a very challenge. Uh, it's a very challenge uh, outcome, to be honest. Uh, these are people who don't have a business and they want to start from zero. And this Creando Ando will help them, uh, will help them create the, the, the business and serve the demand that Rochester will bring from here to 2035. So. And if I may add, I, we also have qualitative expected outcomes, and I believe that these have been reached since day one. The minute that we started developing the relationship with the participants, their experience, their comments, their interactions with others completely change. They feel, a, they feel comfortable in the environment we have created for them, even though it is via Zoom. They all have been participating actively. They all share their different perspectives and fears and also troubles they went through because we have some experienced entrepreneurs already. So they have, um, they can help others to come along and come uh, to set their mind in the game and don't feel, don't be so hesitant on starting their own businesses. And I believe that if we have to add another positive value to this, it, it will be that we have the self-esteem of our participants by the end of the four sessions, we believe it's going to be in a different level, which for us brings more, brings, adds more value to the program than anything else. If you guys want to follow us there, please go ahead and follow us. We're on so very active in social media, so you guys can get a feel on what are we doing in our different areas and departments and what are we um, trying to achieve within uh, with our programs. Juan Pablo, do you want to add anything else? No, I just, I, I was muted. I'm sorry. I just want to thank uh, everyone for, for, the, for the time. Uh, if you have any question, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, again, our next workshop is going to be on July 24th. You are welcome to come. Uh, it's going to be completely in Spanish. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Virtual clapping, everyone. Um, I think there's one question here in the chat from Marty, if you want to ask your question. So um, this is an awesome program. And I was wondering, 
you know, are you fully focused just on the city limits of Rochester um, or kind of more the Rochester Metro people who are involved in the Rochester community? Because I mean, there are some, some of our rural communities that have upwards of 20% Hispanic population um, and they're, they're part of the greater Rochester community. A lot of them are engaged in that kind of just like the rest of us where we're going back and forth and engaged. And if you, you thought about that kind of outreach, even if it's just to kind of increase the pool of people you're dealing with um, and looking at some of the specific challenges that that community might have in the smaller towns. Um, and so just kind of general idea. Yeah, thank you, Marty. So uh, the, 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 the project at the beginning, we, we designed it only for uh, like the Rochester metro, metro area, as you, you said, but um, after, after everything that happened with the COVID-19, we decided to expand it to all Olmsted County. Since now with the technology, we don't have barriers. Uh, so it's uh, for the whole county, Olmsted County, because we know there are a lot of Latinos living in, in, in rural parts of, of not only Olmsted County, but Southern Minnesota. And I have to add that Juan Pablo has been very active on helping them getting more confident and or comfortable in, with, using, with the use of Zoom. And Juan Pablo has been calling them and guiding them how to install them, how to open the link, um, how to create a user if they need to. And to be honest, like that's have helped us a lot. Like we are not just assuming they know how to use the platform, but also I'll help them, them to use and get comfortable with the platform. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah, because that's, that's a challenge we, we, we always see in rural parts that uh, before COVID-19, when you were offering them a service or a product to people living in rural Minnesota that sometimes don't have uh, very expert, a lot of expertise on, on technology. They are like, yeah, but the things that all the services and products are concentrated in the cities and I don't, uh, I don't know how to commute. I don't, they, they, they always give some, I don't want to say excuse, but a reason why they don't receive these services. Uh, or I'm not very expert with this technology. So what we're doing is we're contacting them before the session, uh, guide them to, to log into Zoom. And that's how we're doing uh, I, all right. I all think right. Natalie so, had another question. Yeah, it's, it's Dan and or Natalie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's me. Uh, hey, Juan Natalie. Pablo, Tanya, great presentation. Uh, Creando, Creando Ando seems like a wonderful organization. So I'm glad to see that that's there in, in our community. I apologize if I missed this in the presentation, but are your participants in the program paying anything or is it a completely free program that they can enter? It's a completely free program. Yeah, they, we are doing this uh, supported by the funds that we got, different grants and our supporters, as I mentioned in the beginning. So this is completely free and every single service we provide as an organization, as, as, as an assessor, it's completely out of cost. Amanda has a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on kind of the, the metric just for kind of validation. Um, Cause I think, you know, with our programs too, and thinking about, you know, when people come in, I think our metrics of people starting a business are about the same, what we're trying to get out of it, because, you know, part of it is you want to, you know, help people understand if they should launch or not. And not launching is just as important of a decision as, as launching a business. So I think I just wanted to comment that I, ours are, pretty similar, at least what we're thinking. And some people will come in already with the business too. So that's part of the process too, you know, assessing if the timing is right <laughs> and everything's in place. So yeah, I totally agree um, with that as well. And um, I'm excited to see uh, what happens with, with the program and, and what um, outcomes you guys have in the community here and expansion beyond Rochester. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, as Tanya, as Tanya said, uh, this is a pilot project. Uh, for the uh, and sometimes uh, I think Rochester happened what happened with the middle with the, with the middle class in the economy you know like the rich people let's say in the economy are the twin cities so they receive some some tax help uh, and they receive a lot of services here and let's say low income uh, in the economy people are very rural parts like uh, I don't know Madelia, St. James, even Austin and Rochester is in the middle so you don't, you're not seen like a rural part, but you're not a metro area. So sometimes not many foundations give you resources. 
So that's another reason why we thought this could be a great idea to do it in Rochester. Uh, Chris. Excellent, yeah, I was just gonna ask, what, uh, what experiences do both of you bring to Hacer and then what drew you to, uh, to the mission for, for that? Uh, uh, for, for Hacer, uh, I, wor I, I went to, so what, what expertise I bring to this program, especially I've been working with Southern Minnesota Initiative Foundation as a coach for their Prosperity Initiative program. Uh, my background, I have a master's in business administration and I have an undergrad in business. Five years working as a consultant in Oracle. Uh, but, uh, so, but, but, but I love entrepreneurship. So that's why I decided to, 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 to jump into Hacer and work very, very close to uh, entrepreneurship with Latinos. And why I'm working with Acer, uh, I, I went to Mankato, Minnesota State University, Mankato, and I worked there as a community liaison uh, for the university at the Latino community. And I saw all the needs and all the, um, all the, uh, like, all the potential Latinos in rural Minnesota have. So, so that's why I decided to join Acer and try to do all the programs here in, rural, in the rural part. Yeah. And well, I've been in Minnesota for a year. Before here, I was living in Mexico City. I've, I have an undergrad educational internet, in international relations. I have a specialization degree in Mexico US border. And after graduating, I work in logistics in the energy sector. And now I'm doing business for Latin America from Minnesota. So when I j first came to Minnesota, to be honest, I just was looking for a place where I could get closer to my community. I started as, as a volunteer, and after six months, they offered me a, a part-time position here to develop more leadership programs because I'm also very oriented to women empowerment. So I started doing some women empowerment development programs, and also with Juan Pablo, we it happened to be a really great teammate, and he made me part of his projects, and he put that perspective of how important is the Southern Minnesota and the Latino community living in Southern Minnesota for us and how it should be for everybody. So we together have been working really closely back and forth on developing more entrepreneurship programs, um, bringing to the table our experiences working for big corporates and how to give that mindset of development and growth to those small businesses that want to achieve big things as well. So yeah, that's what I'm here. And I believe that with Acer's mission that it's to bring to light Latino community needs is for us the most important thing because we are Latinos and we feel, we, I believe that we might not feel directly maybe what many of other people have struggled here just because our histories are different our stories are different, but we also understand the need of the community to be heard, to be empowered, and to have to be taken more seriously. And with that, I believe that we just believe in who we are as a community and we put it in every single thing that we do to present it to others. All right, uh, fantastic. <laughs> I was like, that's, that's, I could not be better put. Thank you for that. Um, our last question is from Lauren. Yeah, thank you. Um, this program is awesome. It's really cool to see um, this coming to the Rochester area. It's definitely needed. Um, but I just wanted to ask, um, obviously this is a population um, that um, is in need of, of help, but it's also a population that um, is harder to reach. So I just wanted to know kind of how you guys um, have found the best way to get word of your programs out there for Hacer and, and Creando Ondo and um, kind of how are you reaching your desired populations? Sure. Thank you, Lauren, for the question. So basically, we have understood that in order to, to contact with the Latino community of especially rural parts of Minnesota, you have to be very well connected to the uh, like local community organizations. I mean, it, wouldn't, it would be reckless from your part if you just go there and say like, hey, I'm an organization from the Twin Cities. Uh, you wanna come to a, a, an event? So basically uh, what we did is we, we partnered with ACLA, which is the uh, Association of Chicanos and Latino Americanos in, in Rochester to really go uh, and, and, and gain Latinos trust. So this is, let's say before COVID, that's how we were gonna do it. 
And that's how we started doing it. After COVID, we start uh, connecting, for instance, with Amanda, with the podcast they had on, 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 on Rochester to really talk about our, our, our program. We also use uh, social media, uh, but everything uh, with, through ACLA, which is the Latin organization in Rochester. So, and that's how we do. I mean, if we go to another, let's say Mankato, we try to partner with a local organization in Mankato. I think that's the best way to go connect with these Latinos, uh, small Latino communities. We're very teamwork oriented. Exactly. So we like to strengthen our network. Great, well, the final question we ask at One Million Cups is how can the community help you? That's a great question. That's, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, I, a Collider has been uh, very helpful, um, to be honest, and all the organization uh, Tanya named. I, uh, now that you ask, Jamie, uh, Jamie, I'm sorry, Jaime, Jamie, <laughs> I would like to tell you how, how could uh, you directly uh, help? I remember last YMC, you mentioned something about uh, sales pitch, and I think you have a, a lot of experience on elevator pitch. So what I wanted to ask any of you, uh, since you have more experience on elevator pitch than, than us. Since we want to do the, se the next session focusing on the importance and how to do elevator pitch, if you could help Tanya and I to, to really know how to present or how to do a workshop on that, that could be a great help. Unless you want to do it in Spanish. <laughs> Please go ahead, give it a try. And I believe that with that, what we would say here is that everything is welcome. So experience, expertise, knowledge, resources, either economically or um, techni um, technical resources are very welcome. We really appreciate, uh, we of course as a nonprofit work through funds and grants. So if you guys have an open grant that would be suitable for us to apply in order to keep funding Creando Ando, in order to, to replicate this program in other parts of Southern Minnesota, that will be amazing. But if not, if just with resources, knowledge, expertise, some guidance and say like, hey, Tanya, I've, I happen to know this organization here in this county or this city or in this just, uh, you know, neighborhood, you know, because we never know how we're, you never know where the voice is going to be expanded and will be heard by those that are the perfect fit for this program, right? So if you happen to know anything related to the core basis of the project or else if you happen to know fun or if you happen to have resources that you would like us to share with the community as well because I mean they're not they're not very comfortable like all of them speaking in English however there are some that are but they read English right and they have adapted to these communities so if you have any resources you would like us to share please feel free to, to do it and we will be more than happy to to spread them. Fantastic thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all. All right. This is normally the point where I say get up and get coffee, but uh, I think we'll roll right into our next presenters. So I'm happy to uh, present uh, Dan and Natalie from Fuse. Take it away. Thank you, Jamie. Let's see, bear with me here. I'm going to share a screen. Can everyone see this okay? Great. Well, thank you everyone for being here and helping us out today. We are Fuse Financial Planning. So before we start talking about our business, we thought it would be a little easier for us to talk about ourselves first. So this is Natalie Steigl. Natalie was born and raised in Rochester, Minnesota. She is a certified financial planner. And on the weekend, you may find her striking a new Yoga pose, tending to her garden, or eating homemade hummus. <laughs> and this is Dan Slagle. Dan is born and raised in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I met him at our alma mater, St. Thomas. And Dan is also a certified financial planner, which is really the highest designation in our field of financial planning. On the weekends, we find Dan hiking, running multiple miles, and watching soccer on Saturday mornings. So now a little bit about our business. It's no secret that in our society today, money disagreements are one of the leading causes of separation and tension in households. And we seek to put an end to that. So our mission 
Plain as day is to help couples and young families use money as a tool to become closer together. So a little bit about who we serve. When we created our business, we sought out to serve couples and young families in their 30s and 40s. And so far to this point, it's proved out. Our average household age is 35, and a little bit more about the quantitative, quantitative aspect, the average annual household income is $150,000. Now, it was also very important for us at the beginning to develop a client avatar and client psychographics in order to describe who we want to be working with. We started from zero clients, so we had the opportunity to again develop that psychographic or niche focus on what our clients like to do on the weekends. So what do they like to do? Our clients enjoy being physically active, so you'd find our clients doing yoga, hiking, running, or biking. And on the weekend, you'd find them shopping locally at a local coffee shop, at the local farmer's market, gardening, giving back to the community, and exploring the outdoors. The beauty about all this is we actually ended up just describing ourselves. <laughs> That's okay. It's always nice to work with people that are similar to you. So what makes us different than all the other outlets out there available for financial planning services? Well, there's three main things. Our market, our perspective, and our fee. So let's talk about the market. We, as Dan described, typically serve a much younger demographic than most financial advisors out there. Our client age is between the 30s and 40s. Whereas most of the industry serves folks in the 50s and 60s or older, and the advisors tend to be on that age as well. We found that your financial needs actually start at a much younger age. It can be greater and much more impactful on your situation at younger ages. So it makes sense to start financial guidance at that time. Our perspective. So Dan and I are married couple, and yes, we both have over a decade of experience each of us in the financial financial planning world. So you would think, you know, we get home at night and a financial conversation is easy peasy, no arguments, but that is not the case. Even with our financial expertise, Dan and I ourselves at home have argued about money. We still have disagreements about money. And so we like to relate to our clients, especially those in committed partnerships, that it's okay to have disagreements, how to work through that. And we share it through our own personal lens. We don't have any personal training and therapy or anything like that, but kind of latch onto the idea that we're talking from the perspective not only as experts, but as the personal background and connection to the situation. And lastly, our fee. Most the reason why our industry tends to avoid or not want to work with younger people is because they think from a business perspective, there's no way to make money. And with the old model, that can be true. In fact, a lot of the times when younger clients, so clients in their 30s and 40s, want to work with a financial advisor, the only way to do so is to find someone that will sell them a product or sell them something to get a quick commission off of because that's the only way. Well, Dan and I agree with that wholeheartedly. So what we do with our fee is we charge a subscription for one of our services, which is completely transparent. It'd be no different than your Netflix or Amazon subscription or we charge a one-time flat fee for our services. So I'll talk a little bit about that on our next slide. So we have two main service offerings for our individual and household clients. The first is our ongoing financial planning fee. So this is what I was talking about with the subscription model. So you pay a monthly fee and we need quarterly to discuss your needs, all aspects of your financial plan. The next option that we have is a much shorter term engagement. So we put our quick start financial plan. This engagement is typically over three months and you pay a one-time fee for those three meetings. At the end of the third meeting, we present you with a list of recommendations to just go and implement on your own. So those are our main services for individuals or households. We also have available for businesses and communities for speaking engagements or workshops. So where do we stand today? So in eight months of business, we are happy to say that we have impacted the lives of clients ranging from California to Minnesota to New York. We've been featured in national news publications, as you can see here, 
publications such as CNN, Yahoo Money, and the Huffington Post. So our ask from our wonderful audience today is to create a greater local presence here within Minnesota, and particularly in the southeastern Minnesota area. So we have been able to create that national recognition, but we want to serve the community that we live in and that we work in. Or work in. So our ask is for ideas or connections for speaking engagements locally, or even create business connections so that we could serve that business as an employee benefit, maybe to offer our services. We feel that with these types of engagements, we're also able to reach a greater demographic, maybe those who couldn't afford our service individually, but could at least get some general guidance so that we can serve really all aspects and all income levels. So that is our ask. We're welcoming any questions from the audience at this time. We'll send it back to you, Jamie. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. All right, I know there was a little bit of an audio issue off and on, so I apologize for that. I don't quite know what was going on there. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so does anyone, uh, Lauren, I think you have a question. Yeah, so I was just uh, intrigued by your comments around um, doing more community or speaking engagements. And I was just wondering what those would look like and what you've planned for them, like the content or sessions. Thank you, Lauren. So the, as far as the content, sometimes it's completely up to the community or to the business and what their needs are. For instance, we actually have an engagement coming up a partnership with One Discovery Square, which is a building just two blocks away from where we are now. And they asked us to present on cash flow planning for small businesses. So they came to us with the idea and we're happy to do the research and come up with the material, have them review it. So there's one aspect. There's also the aspect of, um, you know, from a giving back or a volunteer standpoint, we've done services where maybe we go into a low income housing and they're saying, can you just come in and provide guidance, you know, financial one-on-one -on -one and start from there and create whatever type of material you'd like. So we could do that as well. For businesses, what's a really big advantage is for us to evaluate their benefit packages to their employees. And then what we do is we can speak to the employees on their specific benefit package and how each employee can take advantage of all of their different offerings. Amanda. Oh, <laughs> she's sending me something. Um, we're just trying to figure out, your sound is just a little glitchy for some reason. So we were trying to figure that out in the background, your technical crew behind the scenes here. Um, uh, Chris has a question. Yeah, I was just going to uh, ask you, you mentioned you had 10 years of experience in the industry from both of you, but uh, could you go a little bit, uh, how did you get started in the industry? Yeah, thanks, Chris. So we both started as interns at the bottom of the ladder, um, if you will, and worked our way up to become financial planners, uh, serving each serve a book of clients. But it was actually the industry that brought us together, believe it or not. And I was actually Natalie's uh, study buddy, as inappropriate or appropriate as that is. Uh, that's what really got us connected again. So this industry has really been us together for the last decade. And um, Dan's uh, degree is in finance, my degree is in business, so it only makes sense that we could have business around finance. Um, we we wanted to make sure that we both obtained industry experience with firms that have done it and have been successful. And so we our backgrounds materials actually working with people who are in their fifties and sixties and seventies. But it's so interesting starting our firm because we actually didn't have nearly as much experience working with the demographic we want to work with. But our personal experience has helped quite a bit, and now it just 
it's been interesting to see what their needs are versus someone who's working Other questions? Silence. Oh, Ms. I'll Golden. ask a question. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask again about um, the speaking, the workshops, because um, I think at least my understanding was this was something new for you guys. And I had a thought about that for you a few days ago, but I forgot what it was. So I'll have to write it down. But anyway, um, I was wondering, you know, what, um, what led you guys to think about doing this and adding this to kind of your revenue streams? What was kind of that process and what are you hoping to gain um, out of this at the other end? Like, do you have some kind of outcome or, or number that you'd like to do um, this year? Thanks for the question, Amanda. Uh, I, it's interesting, and the entrepreneurs on this call, there's something about when you start a business, you get a little scared of the idea of only having one source of income from that business. You kind of want to diversify it. There's because there's money on your business being successful. It holds up your household. So we do want to create different revenue streams and different sources of income for us that aren't just through clients. You know, we, whether that we even tossed on the idea of, oh, should we start a podcast? Should we write a book? You know, you can hear it be wonderful. Now we'd like, we want, we've been successful with the clients, the position that way we want to Now the next phase of our business to see successful is payments and revenue through larger sources of the community or businesses. As far as that goal, I don't think we need one for this year. So that would be a good idea for us to work on. Yeah, what really put in, in light the idea of giving back to the community through workshops is the recent pandemic that's taking place. Um, yes, it helped the science issue first. Uh, people are questioning their personal finances now. And we think it's a great way for businesses to give back to their employees who are now coming back on staff or on payroll to help educate them again in the future that they're prepared for. Um, Lauren, you had another question. Yeah, my, I actually had a question, but I kind of want to stick with what we were just talking about with the community speaking engagements, because I do find it to be so relevant right now and everything. And this isn't really a question, but more of just an idea for you guys. So I think about, you know, in a previous role in my job, I worked at um, a the U of M in a residency program for medical doctors. And a lot of these universities have these social and hardship budgets. And I know like in the past they had brought in financial planners because these students are, you know, largely in debt because they did go to undergrad medical school and now residency. So I think that could be a really um, interesting idea if like, you know, Mayo or the U of M had these opportunities to get in and work with these students as well. I think, I mean, they would probably really appreciate it. I've talked to them in the past too. And so I think that is a really cool idea and um, love the community outreach you guys are thinking about. Thanks, Lauren, for the idea. Yeah. Uh, uh, Stefan. I'm jumping on voice. I'll jump on voice then. Hey guys, great presentation. Thank you for that. Um, so we've, we've spoken about this a, little, a couple times in the past, but I think it's always worth mentioning, especially to uh, you know your target demographic here. Um, what are some of the, the financial planning blind spots that you often have to go over with, with people in the demographic that you're serving? I asked that question kind of for the selfish reason of trying to communicate to the people in the arguably the same demographic that I regularly work with at the clinic that have no concept. You know, most of us are fellows or residents or med students or um, somewhere in that space. And uh, yeah, we, we don't even know what we're getting ourselves into. So what are some of the blind spots that you guys commonly come across? 
I would say a big blind spot is the focus and attention on cash flow planning. So usually when you're talking to someone about anything financially, it's someone oh, it's in a stock and it's up 20%. And that's usually where the issue goes and stuff. But nobody talks about, hey, I realized that I have a surplus of cash flow of $500 a month, and I'm just saying it sits there not doing anything. That huge, huge disadvantage if you don't know that and act on it. So I would like to say the habit of saving is more important than the return because once you get the money in an investment, then you can really see it work time to time. Of course, you have to get it in there. And the only way to figure it out to make it is to know what's coming in and what's going out. And a lot of people just have no idea on what that is. So with, um, with all of our clients, our first really engagement is tackling that piece. And I think some people are like, oh, you know, that's, that's so, it seems maybe juvenile or it doesn't seem as important to us talking about investment, but it is so important. And then it opens your eyes to everything going on in the plan. So we spend a lot of time and a lot of energy all parties involved in form. It's only as good as, you know, me and the whole household know what's going on. And then we tackle everything else in the financial plan. Uh, you probably pick up, we like to talk a lot about the quantitative aspect of what we do. And I, another blind spot is in a relationship. And again, we focus on couples and young families. So typically, there's two parties involved. And a big blind spot that we find that we recognize is there's always a, a financial spouse and a non financial spouse. So there's someone in the household that has a firm grasp of what's going on, how the bills are being paid, and what they're doing to save more. Or the person who's more well educated in around money. And then there's another person who unfortunately is not. There's this guy. So our clients, what we like to do, like Natalie said, is take a uh, purposeful time, have purposeful time to have those conversations. Making sure both parties are in alignment of what their values are, what the purpose is uh, of money behind the scene. Uh, along with that, what we also like to focus on is asking questions to make sure again the goals are, are aligned there is that aligned vision because what we found in our previous roles is that there are couples in their 50s and 60s or 70s where one person has handled the money over the course of that relationship and what happens when that spouse is no longer present then you're leaving a huge burden with the other partner and we we just We've seen it too many times and we just want that to end completely. So that is a huge block that we try to uh, educate our clients on. Great. Um, I guess uh, the final question would be, again, you had a slide on it, I think, but what can the community do for you? If you work for a business or if you're a part of a community that could use a speaker, then we would love to be considered as someone um, value that we can provide to that business community. Um, and of course, we're always looking to grow on our client side as well, um, but we just haven't seen that aspect of our business with the community outreach, with the speaking engagement, or the paid workshops. We haven't seen that taken off yet. So if you have any ideas or connections, we welcome them, and uh, that would be wonderful. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. So all right, so that will do it for A Million Cups for July. Um, thank you to our speakers for sharing their stories with us. We will see you at the next One Million Cups on August 5th. I can't even imagine I'm saying August 5th. Um, stay safe, everyone, and hopefully uh, we'll see you in person very, very soon. Thank